Hotel. Great shot. Bit of a homage to The Shining. Praise him, eh? The God Complex. Cool. Praise him. Speaking of a god. Let's go to Raven's Gala, he says. Okay, I need everyone to. Hey! I recognize that face. Be careful, yeah? Pupils are dilated. They are surprised as we are. Besides which, if it's a trick, it'll tell us something. Oh, you're good. Oh, she's good. Joe, but he's uh, tied up right now. <laughs> Doing what? No, I mean, he's tied up. Right Literally. Now. Ooh. No. I'm the doctor. We're going to die here. Is there something here with us? <laughs> Go on then, Joe. Something to add, Joe. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Chop, 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 chop. Can we do something about him? Gag him. <laughs> Personally, I think you've got the right idea. At times like this, I think of my old school motto. Resistance is exhausting. <laughs> What's loser in Klingon? <laughs> oh no. Okay, that's not the Suntaran, that's something else. Oh, okay. Just some nightmares, right? Mean girls for him, I suppose. Now, are they going to get separated sooner or later? I do like it. Anytime there is a big group together, kind of navigating through it together. Look at this. Oh, it's her notes. Lucy. Fire exit, eh? Uh, guys, I, I found a. Mm. Oh boy. Is that her dad? A B in mathematics? You are lazy. Do you understand me, girl? Lazy. I'm sorry. Daddy, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, angels. Right. Don't blink. Look at you. You're beautiful. <laughs> of course. Is it like a minotaur? In the maze? In the labyrinth? That is a hotel? It's a labyrinth. It's certainly set up as a labyrinth. Go on, focus on it. The light? <laughs> of course, if the weeping angels were meant for me, then your room is still out there. Yeah. Somewhere. Was that necessary? And this is a cup of tea. Of course, I'm British. It's how we cope with trauma. <laughs> Which is? This is Jahanam. You're a Muslim. Don't be frightened. Hell? Do you think this is hell? Gibbous. <laughs> it's an alien. I'm gonna file that under freak out about later. She's from the night of. Doctor, look at this. Time for a talk. Your civilization is one of the oldest in the galaxy. Now I see why. Cowardice isn't quaint, it's sly. Him. Oh, it's his whole it's the horns that do the scratching. Praise it's a recording. Ah, uh, what is that word? The, the, the guard. No, the, the warden. This is a prison. Mmm. Oh, it's sad. You want this to stop. Oh, easy now, Amy. It could be a number of things, given the things I've seen. Or the things Amy's seen. Let's see that. He got free. He overpowered me. <laughs> the look of disgust. Maybe you're not scared of anything. Well, after all the time I spent with you in the TARDIS, what was left to be scared of? <laughs> you said that in the past tense. No, I didn't. Yeah. How he had been in speech therapy, he just got over this massive stammer. For an achievement, I mean, can you imagine? You've forgotten that all victories are about saving the universe. Hmm. Why what? Why is it up to you to save us? That's 
quite a god complex you have there. Oh, how about that? I bought them here. I'd say it was their choice, but offer a child a suitcase full of sweets and they'll take it. Offer someone all of time and space and they'll take that too, which is why you shouldn't. Ooh, imagine if I get to see the doctor's room. Huh. <laughs> Eleven. <laughs> Religious faith, faith in something. My, your faith in me. Hmm. Which is why, at the end of her note, Lucy said, "Praise him." Exactly. Oh no, she's praising. No. Oh please, no. Whose room is this? Oh. Yeah. Stole your childhood and now I've led you by the hand to your death. But the worst thing is I knew. I knew this would happen. This is what always happens. L He's trying to make her lose the faith. <laughs> Forget your faith in me. Oh. I took you with me because I was vain. Because I wanted to be adored. Glorious bond. Girl who waited for me. Hmm. Wow. I really am just a madman in a box. And it's time we saw each other as we really are. That should do it, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. An ancient creature drenched in the blood. Of the innocent drifting in space through an, uh, an endless shifting maze. Is that not the doctor? He's creature. Death would be a gift. I wasn't talking about myself. Yeah, okay. It's a risk I'm willing to take. <laughs> uh, this is interesting. Bit of a goodbye hey. from the looks of it. I thought it was Mel's car. Because you're still breathing. <laughs> yeah. Or well, maybe there's a bigger, scarier adventure waiting for you in there. <laughs> Can't happen like this. After everything we've been through, Doctor. Wow. Everything. And what's the alternative? Me standing over your grave? <laughs> over your broken body? Over Rory's body? <laughs> oh, wow. <sighs> it's happening. If you bump into my daughter, tell her to visit her old mum sometime. <laughs> Look after him. Look after you. Oh. Wow. Yeah, she's gonna let it out now. Oh, Doctor, once again, just you and me. But there are some things that need to be taken care of, right? There's only two episodes to go, and there's still the mystery of... Episode 1, and the death of the Doctor. Aww. Oh. Aww. Oh. Wow, you know, so there it is. It appears to be the goodbye, the send-off to Amy and Rory, though, you know, I've got to be honest, I don't believe for a second that this is the last time <laughs> that, that I'll be seeing Amy and Rory with the doctor. I just don't, I just don't think so. Um, listen, it, it was certainly a painful moment. I felt that, yeah, it was quite an emotional moment. And you see, you see that the doctor didn't try to make it, he didn't want to make it an emotional, you know, goodbye or, um, 
a sad moment or anything. He wanted to kind of play it cool. He kind of wanted to make it seem like, okay, you know, it's okay, it's okay. You know, you guys go live your life. Uh, I'll, you know, go on, do my thing. But you see it in the eyes. You know, Matt Smith, once again, you see it in the eyes, the sadness in the eyes. Uh, and then of course, you know, the, the final shot as it fades to black. Uh, the doctor in the TARDIS, once again, by himself. Um, though, of course, you know, they've established that he's not truly ever by himself, but he can't really communicate with the TARDIS either, right? So, um, but beyond that, you know, to lose, to have to, you know, uh, say goodbye uh, with uh, Amy and then Rory as well, you see that, of course, it's going to affect him. You know, he's come to love the company of these two individuals. Um, he's come to love them, care for them. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't think it's the last time I'll see them. Uh, again, you know, it is, it is quite a unique situation. It's quite a rare situation to, to say goodbye to, you know, part, um, from a companion, uh, before the finale or, you know, at least that's what I'm used to. Right. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, it, it just feels like this is not the final goodbye. Though I'm not saying it simply has to be the finale. I'm just saying it's a bit different. You know, things are a bit different here. Though, of course, this also kind of sets up the beginning of the series now. Series 7. Or sorry, not 7. Series 6. Uh, so he's about to spend the next 200 years by himself, right? And then uh, that's the doctor that apparently dies, right? So there's only two episodes left. It has to get into that, right? Unless... I don't know, maybe it does kind of, you know, just go into series seven as well. Though, you know, it feels like the big plot of this series. So I feel like it is going to be resolved um, as much as it can be. But yeah, you know, uh, I'm going to go ahead and assume it's probably about to be a two-parter. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, 200 years. Uh, and then essentially, is, is this kind of out of order? Um, you know, forgive me if I'm kind of mixing things up here, but, you know, now this doctor is about to go spend 200 years, and then if you go back to the opening, right, uh, episode one, Amy and Rory get that message, right, the TARDIS blue letter that shows up. Um, was that, yeah, I guess, yeah, it's, it's kind of being depicted or showcased a bit out of order, right? Um, unless I have it completely wrong, you know, feel free to correct me if I'm on the wrong track. But yeah, so that, so the ending of this kind of leads into, again, 200 years for the doctor, at least, you know, for Amy and Rory, it's just normal time. So yeah, I guess this kind of leads into the opening of series six, right? Um, you know, there's that really interesting moment as well, right? Um, Rory th speaking in the past tense and the doctor immediately catches it as well. Right? So there's a lot of really interesting things going on. Another thing that really stuck out to me is the doctor happily chomping on an apple, right? <laughs> you know, they established all the time ago in the 11th hour that apples are not his thing. You know, he spits out that green apple, I believe. But yeah, you know, him chomping on an apple happily, uh, you know, Rory's past tense slip up or moment, because it's not really a slip up. He doesn't even realize he said it. So this episode really kind of makes the doctor realize, okay, you know, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep putting them in danger like this. You know, I'm the one who's responsible for them. I'm the one who made them come along in the first place. And, you know, this kind of even goes into that interesting aspect as well, right? Informed consent, right? He goes into this, you know, um, thing about, you know, offer candy to a child, they'll take it, offer all of space and time, they'll take that too, right? So there is an element of informed consent or a lack of informed consent. Yes, they're adults, but at no point, and there's just no capacity there to even fathom or imagine the things they're about to face in all of time and space on their travels in time and space. But of course, they'll say yes to it because yes, you know, to adults, it is a bit like offering candy. How could you say no to it? How could you say, know the time and space and the doctor knows this right? he he knows this as well and he realizes um this tactic almost listen i'm not trying to talk down on my doctor here uh you know of course uh, i love the doctor but yeah he realizes that you know this question that he poses this offer that he puts on the table it's uh it, you know it's <laughs> he knows uh the outcome he even offers it to rita doesn't he 
who of course kind of, you know, tells him, I think you've done it again just now. And, you know, I've got to say, Rita is a fantastic one episode character. Um, and I think this episode did a great job of uh, the characterization of these uh, one episode characters, the ensemble. Um, I thought it was a great ensemble cast for this episode. Uh, Rita specifically is a standout, of course. Uh, you know, they, they're really leaning into her potentially being or, sh- or her being a fantastic candidate for a companion, right? It wasn't meant to be, of course. And, you know, of course, you know, speaking of Rita, uh, you know, her faith, uh, you know, she is Muslim. Uh, that, that is a focus here as well, right? Uh, you know, a few comedic moments as, as a doctor realizes she is Muslim because she uh, mentioned Jahannam and that's meant to be hell. Right? In Islam, that is uh, hell. And of course, the doctor picks up on this. He knows, right? He, he knows quite a bit, doesn't he? Uh, but, you know, her reply, don't be frightened. <laughs> now, listen, I don't know if the inclusion of this character who happens to be Muslim and, you know, her speaking of Jahannam um, and, you know, that joke about don't be frightened. I'm not sure if this is like uh, because of Islamophobia, perhaps, you know, they wanted to get a Muslim character in there. Um, and she's quite a likable individual but you know the other aspect of this episode the fears or the bad dreams in those rooms you know her being her father essentially right so you know a certain section uh probably understands that you know if you know you know uh you know never being able to live up to those high expectations impossibly uh high expectations of your parents though of course i think that is something a lot of people from totally different backgrounds can relate to as well you know living up to expectations of your parents, uh, the impossibly high expectations and how problematic that is for a lot of um, children or, you know, people, uh, even adults even, right? Um, So, yeah, you know, I really liked um, that it is kind of leading into that aspect of it as well here. Um, A lot of great themes in this one. Of course, faith is one of them. And then a healthy skepticism of faith, right? You see that Amy, you know, she has this undeniable faith uh, in the doctor to a fault even right so much so uh, that it almost gets her killed and you know it, it's this turning point it is this turning point uh for the doctor he realizes okay no you know i have to make her realize that i am not this godly entity i'm not this um infallible being right that's always going to be there to save people to save you right he implores her to see him for who he truly is Right? And it kind of circles back to something that was kind of established, um, though, you know, at that point, it kind of felt like a joke. But, you know, it kind of does circle back to it quite effectively, doesn't it? I'm speaking of the 11th hour. You know, I believe he said something along those lines. You know, it's so important for you to realize that I'm just a madman in a box, in a big blue box. Something along those lines kind of circles back to that or to this now, doesn't it? Right. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a massive moment. It's a big moment for the doctor to kind of realize this and initiate this and kind of, you know, part and send them back before he gets them killed, right? Um, he's put them in situations so many times already that could have gotten them killed, right? Here he messes up. He, he got it wrong, right? And you see, that's like a reality check. That's like a call, a wake-up call for him. Uh, once again, he's like, no, 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 I can't keep dodging this bullet, you know? Again, it kind of goes back to that conversation um, uh, near the conclusion, right? As he's telling Amy, you know, uh, one of these days it might be over your dead body, right? Something along those lines. So, yeah. uh, I mean, listen, essentially he is making the right choice. It hurts. It's painful. But, yeah, you know, he is making the right choice. And all this kind of goes back to the, you know, that point I make about companions not knowing the right time to depart or part or separate. Uh, here you have the doctor kind of stepping in, right, and realizing, okay, you know, uh, I think enough is enough. Put them in enough danger already, right? Um, it's because of me that they've had a lot of these problems, right? And it, wasn't I talking about this um, in the last episode that it, it is starting to feel like it could be the beginning of the end or in not beginning of the end, but that Rory is essentially uh, done, Right. It sounded like, okay, this is perhaps the end of the line, right? Soon. And I feel like that that conversation uh, is, it made an impact. It had an impact. It's playing a part here um, in the doctor's decision as well, right? Um, You know, to me, it it feels like even Amy, maybe even Amy might be done, right? You know, she loves the doctor. She loves traveling with the doctor. But I feel like a part of her might actually be ready to kind of 
take a break. Um, given how things have played out as well, you know, and they lost their daughter as well. So, so yeah, you know, it's, it's a bittersweet moment, isn't it? Because on one end, I am happy for Amy and Rory that they do get to spend some quality time together, you know, just a normal life, you know, in each other's company as husband and wife, right? A lot of fun times ahead for them. And of course, you know, leading up to this, uh, the doctor's darker tendencies and fallibility has certainly been on display over the last few episodes, right? I mean, it's quite an interesting pairing, this episode and the last episode. Um, yeah, you know, given how older Amy completely lost faith in the doctor. And of course, you know, that moment as the Minotaur is speaking of uh, having blood, so much blood on your hands, you know, something along those lines. You know, the doctor <laughs> realizing that the Minotaur isn't speaking isn't speaking of itself, but speaking of the doctor, wow. You know, that's yet another thing that kind of, uh, almost kind of, not jabs them, but almost another thing, uh, like a check mark um, in terms of, okay, another reason I should, you know, really go and drop Amy and Rory off now. This is the right moment. And it also kind of goes back to that notion that the TARDIS is always taking the doctor to the spot or the place he needs to get to. Right, And in this case, this is the place he needed to get to, to realize uh, and to have these experiences, to realize that, okay, now is the time. Now is the time to drop Amy off. Now is the time to park before it's too late, right? Um, and yeah, you know, the TARDIS is certainly playing its part. You know, this is the moment he had to set Amy free from himself. This is the place he needed to get to. But yeah, that conversation is quite the scene, isn't it? Uh, it is a bit of a sad moment um, as, it's time to almost say goodbye to your childhood, right? Uh, as he's speaking to young Amy and, you know, there's that reality check, right? Amy Pond, Amy Williams. Um, yeah, yeah. And even the name, Amy Pond, doesn't it have this fantastical uh, fairy tale uh, tone to it, doesn't it, Amy Pond? But Amy Williams sounds like a proper, an actual grounded name, doesn't it, right? Um, so yeah, a lot of reality checks in this episode for the doctor as well um quite a few of them actually um and i've got to say you know in terms of the characters that goat man again he's not a, i'm not sure if he is a goat man but he kind of reminded me of this overgrown sheep or goat uh kind of like mr tumnus from narnia <laughs> now that's an interesting character actually that's probably one of the standout characters um because you know on the surface he he you know, he, he looks like and he presents himself as this innocent, harmless individual, right? You know, earlier on, it really does feel like a comedic relief character. But as the story progresses, as the stakes escalate, yeah, then you start seeing the true nature. And, you know, this is quite a dark character, really is. Uh, quite a nasty individual, isn't he? You know, this is an individual who's able to kind of let go of any sort of self-respect, right? He's able to cross any sort of line in the pursuit of survival, right? Um, I mean, the doctor doctor sees this, he knows this, he understands this now. And, you know, there's quite a moment as he kind of confronts this individual. Uh, you know, forgive me, I can't remember the exact name. You know, he sees through it. He sees how his people, uh, or the true nature of his people and how they're able to survive this whole time, right? Yeah, it's quite the moment as the doctor leans in, right? And he's like, I, I know you, I see through you. I, I know how your people function. And you see these types of characters. In, in survival situations and, you know, be it uh, film or television, uh, usually you'll see this type of character um, in uh, zombie apocalypse, right? You know, I'm thinking of Train to Busan. For those who've seen it, there's that high ranking individual who thinks he's special. He thinks he's, you know, above anyone else and that his continued survival is uh, paramount, right? Um, and he throws a lot of people under the bus, right? Um, uh, to survive, essentially. Uh, but, you know, that's just one example. You see these types of characters, right, who think their survival is um, important, more important than anyone else's, right, that they need to get out of this somehow. Um, so, yeah, you know, I thought that was actually a really interesting character, a lot of darkness beneath, right? Uh, they, that, you know, that innocent, disarming nature is almost kind of like a facade, right? And again, the doctor sees it. He sees through it. And, of course, it turned out that uh, the you know the angels are his fear right and i guess it makes sense right um because the angels are not going to conquer his people or that place right that's not, that's just not in their that's just not their mo <laughs> you know the angels that, they don't care about that so it makes sense that he that you know the angels are his fear and of course amy's was 
you know, waiting for the doctor, the doctor never coming back. Um, and then the doctors is really quite interesting, isn't it? Because they, they kind of hint at it, but they don't quite tell you. You know, if I'm being honest, you know, I'll get into some speculation, but if I'm being honest, they should, I hope they keep it like that. I don't need to see it. I don't need to get, get an answer for this, like a specific answer. I don't need it. Something about not knowing it, um, it it's intriguing. Now, I know that sound. I've heard it. You know, I heard it all that time ago in series one, you know, Eccleston. Um, uh, and I remember the interior going all red. Uh, so I know that sound, that sound effect. And of, of course, I've heard it a few more times since, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, that's usually in dangerous situations, right? Like really dangerous situations. It's a warning alarm, right? Uh, but, you know, again, it should be noted that the doctor is saying, who else, right? So it is meant to be someone, right? Though, of course, the TARDIS, um, the TARDIS is, you know, they firmly established that the TARDIS is uh, an entity on its own. So he could be speaking of the TARDIS as well, right? Who else? Uh, I mean, I saw the personification of the TARDIS not too long ago in that fantastic episode, right? Uh, but yeah, so I guess the Doctor Sphere is potentially losing uh, the TARDIS um, or something along those lines, you know, that's just speculation. It could be anything really. Uh, the one thing that is really given to us is that the sound is emanating from the TARDIS, right? I've heard it before. I've got to say, I really enjoyed the setting, the hotel that doubles as the labyrinth for the Minotaur, right? Uh, <laughs> Theseus and the Minotaur. Um, and of course, a lot of the photography is really uh, the standout here, you know, a lot of Dutch angles, some great transitions. Uh, of course, you know, it's impossible not to notice that it's meant to be um, kind of like a homage to The Shining as well, right? Uh, but yeah, you know, the, that setting, the hotel setting is kind of creepy. It is. It has that liminal space feel to it, doesn't it? It really makes for a great setting for this kind of story, doesn't it? Uh, or any kind of creepy story. Uh, or suspense, but yeah, I've got to say, I really did enjoy that episode. I did. Um, and it, it was a big episode. It was, especially given the conclusion of this episode as well and how things are going to play out from this point on. Again, like I mentioned, I don't think it's the last time I'll ever see those two with the Doctor, but yeah, you know, as of this point, officially, they've parted, right? Uh, though, of course, I know um, this Doctor you know, goes on to live for 200 years and then that whole thing happens back in episode one, right? Uh, so that still needs uh, answering, doesn't it? I still need some answers for that situation and I'm sure I'll get them, I'll, I'm sure I'll get them. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how others, uh, how many of you saw this episode because, you know, a thing I've noticed and I've mentioned it before, a lot of these episodes do end up being quite divisive, don't they? Uh, but yeah, you know, if you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. If you are interested in full length or perhaps even early access to the next episode right now, consider checking out the Patreon page. The links are in the description and the pinned comment. Also the links for social media, uh, Instagram and Twitter, if you're into that. And you know, before I sign off, I should mention, yes, you know, You've noticed by now that it's a new place. I've moved into my new uh, home, essentially. Um, and there is a bit of an echo at the moment, right? But I still need to put up uh, the sound panel, the, the treatment, the sound treatment panels. Um, they're going to go up soon, soon-ish. Uh, maybe mid-September, by the end of September, because I do need help getting them up. You know, it's not a one-man job. Uh, so the soonest I can get someone to help me out is not quite yet, but soon, soon. Uh, but you know, once those are up, the, the audio quality, the sound, is going to be at the same level it was at the old place. Until then, I think this is watchable, but it is going to improve dramatically. Whew, okay, so thank you for joining me and thank you for your time, as time is precious. And I do hope to see you again soon for the next one. Until then, take it easy.